by uh, um, talking a little bit about nomenclature because a lot of times people are talking about online learning uh, as if we're all talking about the same thing, but there are a lot of different variations. And um, just, just to, to go through the lexicon a little bit, um, the first type of, of learning environment I'll mention is the, is the one that is not online, which is traditional classroom learning. Um, the, a type that is slightly more or somewhat more online than that, I'm going to call enhanced classroom learning. That's what we do a lot of at Vassar and uh, places like Vassar, which is to say that students meet regularly and frequently face-to-face -face classes, but there's also some online materials or, or maybe online activities like uh, posting to a forum or, or a blog or taking a quiz uh, or an exam or something online. So traditional face-to-face -face learning, meet regularly and frequently, but do some activities in addition online. Uh, now we get to some things that we're not so familiar with at Vassar. Uh, blended learning, uh, which is also called in some cases hybrid learning or hybrid courses. Uh, this involves a combination of students meeting face-to-face -face in class, but usually not so frequently uh, and do a lot uh, of their activities, in many cases a majority of their course activities online. Uh, so this is done a lot in places, uh, typically programs that use this have students who are adult learners, uh, who um, are enrolled in a course or a program that's not convenient for them to get to, maybe it's a campus that's 100 miles away, they have face-to-face -face meetings maybe four or five times a semester, but they do a majority of their activity uh, through online means. Then there's full-fledged distance learning, which means in, in which a student takes an entire course, in some cases an entire degree programs, but at least an entire course online. So never any face-to-face -face, uh, uh, meeting with classmates or teachers. And then the most extreme example, um, which has gotten a lot of um, uh, notice in the last uh, several months, um, is what's called Massive Online Open Course, or MOOC, because everything is an, an acronym, right? Uh, in a MOOC, there may be thousands, tens of thousands, and in a couple of cases, I think over 100,000 students in a single course. These are not students who are enrolled in a particular university program. They're not matriculated. Um, typically, there's, there's not feedback from an instructor. It's just materials or activities are available online. They can take it, no accreditation. Um, um, it's just learning for learning's sake. So um, as we talk about these things, we might want to keep in mind, you know, when someone says something about uh, a particular, you know, their feelings about online learning. Well, are you really, are you talking about something like MOOCs or something more like just, uh, you know, a blended learning situation? Um, quickly, I want to mention uh, a couple of the things that have, um, have, have been prominent lately. Um, this first one's not too recent, but uh, Carnegie Mellon for uh, uh, 10 years or so has uh, run the Open Learning Initiative um, they make these, this is a combination of MOOC and distance learning because they make these courses available online to anyone who just might want to click on it and start learning something. But what they prefer to do is partner with colleges and universities who will um, um, agree to make those online courses um, worth credit in their own institution for their own matriculated students. They've been around for 10 years, they've developed 15 courses. They're doing a very careful um, uh, job of that. Um, Udemy, which we'll hear more about from uh, Professor Ho, is uh, absolutely a MOOC. It has a thousand courses. It's not associated with any particular universities. Um, they have a lot of students. Um, it's um, it just um, a lot of material for a lot of people to learn from. Um, Coursera, in the news a lot, at least the news that I look at, uh, it's only been around since this last April. Um, 
they partner with colleges and universities um, so that a particular university will sign on or, or, or um, um, have a contract with Coursera so that their students can enroll in, in Coursera courses. Um, there are at this point 199 courses in their system created by a number of different institutions. Um, 33 have partnered with them. 32 of those are research universities. One of them, Wesleyan, is a liberal arts college, which I think will be interesting for us to, to consider. Um, edX was founded even more recently, just this past May, by Harvard and MIT. Um, they have so far developed eight courses. Um, they've um, added a couple more university partners and, and hope to get more. And uh, finally, one that's quite interesting uh, for us here, a company called Tudor, and actually um, several days ago they changed their name. Uh, they're now 2U instead of 2 Tor. Um, they've been around for a few years. They offer complete, uh, they've partnered with universities to offer complete degree programs online for graduate programs in certain uh, institutions. They're now embarking on a new project to offer individual courses, undergraduate courses online, working with liberal arts colleges. Um, and they've been poking around Vassar, for instance. Um, so I'm just going to, uh, um, with that background, uh, I'm going to turn over to our panel, uh, each of whom is going to speak for five to 10 minutes, 10 minutes, and then we'll have some time for, for discussion among the group. Our panelists are Professor Ben Ho from Economics, uh, Sarah Cheng, class of 13, uh, and, and here as uh, representative of the Committee on Academic Technology, Matt Harvey, who is the VSA's Vice President for Academics, and Tom Elman from the Department of Computer Science and the Studies Program. Uh, and I'll turn it over to Ben. So I'm going to try something new. Uh, are you recording? Did you, did you do the microphone? Or? Sorry, sorry, I meant to mention to everyone, we are uh, recording this session for people who may want to watch it weren't able to be here. So um, keep that in mind if that's an issue for you. But, uh, you're recording just a room. Yeah, you can. So not, not the mic. OK, so everyone yeah. can hear me OK? I don't like microphones. Um, yeah. So new for me to sort of talk without slides, but I, I figure I'll, I'll try something new today. Um, basically, I'm an economist, all right? And I think I, I come approaching this question of integrating technology in, in the classroom and sort of teaching online from an economics point of view. Um, and have been, as someone who have, have, having studied, you know, the economics of education and having studied computer science, there's sort of three frameworks I sort of think about when thinking about um, the, the, the future of online learning. Um, the first is a, 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 something in economics called Baumel's cost disease. All right, and Baumel's cost disease, and he, 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 this is an old idea. He, he, he published this like 40 years ago, but he has a new popular book now trying to sort of catch the wave with Freakonomics trend and cash in on his, you know, economics. But I think the idea is really powerful, right? He said that uh, like most, most things in society, you know, mo mo most, most things get cheaper and cheaper over time, right? So like you think, think about cars, think, think about televisions, think about, think about computers. Think, as technology gets better, things get cheaper because it requires fewer and fewer people to make those same. But something that's different is basically um, some goods, like the same music, is fundamentally different than that. Right? I think the classic example is a Mozart quartet. A Mozart quartet that lasts four minutes and 17 seconds required four people, four minutes and 17 seconds of their time to produce in 1812, as it does produce in 2012. We just haven't gotten any better at producing Mozart quartets. And the same is sort of true for education, right? Over the past 200 years, you know, or the past 2,000 years, you know, we're, still we're still teaching in much the same way. We're, we're basically in the classroom, you know, basically like Socrates and Plato, just basically talking it through discussion. And as a result, you know, whereas, whereas things like computers get cheaper and cheaper, things like education gets more and more expensive. And, you know, Baba didn't worry too much about that, right? Because I think that's just sort of a, a natural part of the economy. But it's something that I think people are very concerned about as higher education in particular gets more and more expensive. How do we, how do we deal with that? All right, the second sort of literature in economics that I think is relevant to this is thinking about models of, models of education, all right? So as we think about online courses, people, you know, people worry that, you know, what's the point of an online course if you don't get a degree, 
All right, and so there's, there's like, you know, sort of two strands of literature in economics that sort of addresses this question. The first is basically comes from, uh, that comes from basically Heckman, um, Nobel Prize winner, who basically sort of talked talk about the human capital theory of education. Right, the reason we get, edu get edu educated is because it gives us sort of human capital, it makes us more productive, we actually learn something. The alternative model of education is sort of the Spence model of education. We also got a Nobel Prize for this, you know, uh, about 10 years ago. And the Spence model of education says the point of getting educated is to show off how smart you are, right? I mean, you go to, you go to Vassar, you take classes in art history and, 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 and literature, it's never gonna be useful, but by proving that you can sort of do that, right, that you, you basically show to the world that you're a smart person, and then that Vassar degree basically to sort of signals your ability, even though you, have, you don't actually learn anything. Right, so so the, what's heartening is that yeah no no what's heartening is that people sort of tested these two theories right one is the human capital theory and what is the signaling theory and they find that actually education is more about human capital than signaling right so even so and, and the way they test it, one way they test this is they compare people who basically have say like you know three and a half years of college education without getting a degree versus someone that someone that finished the degree and they find that they're actually about the same. Right, so that just having the degree doesn't actually matter, it's, it's the signaling part doesn't actually matter, it's actually just spending that time in college, learning things actually you know, produces something. And that's important for thinking about online education, right? That, you know, wh why are people taking classes online, even if they can't get a degree from it? Well, they actually may, might learn something from it, and I think that's really important. Um, and then so the, sort of the third literature in the economics of education that's sort of relevant to this question is the question on education and competition, right? So I think, um, I think there's been a lot of research, especially looking at public schools, that sort of shows that competition is you know, really helpful. I think the U.S. I think the, the standard anecdote is the U.S. is probably one of the best higher education systems in the world because there's so much competition between different colleges, and maybe one, probably some of the potentially one of the I don't want to say worst, but you know one of the sort of not best you know sort of you know, sort of sort of uh, primary school and middle school educations in the world because of the lack of competition and they find that sort of injecting and, and so Hawksby and others find that injecting competition into education basically you know makes makes everyone more productive and I think online education is basically a good avenue toward that all right so you know so so so, so that's sort of the, the framework I'm using to think about this my past experience in sort of using technology and education has sort of varied you know I sort of I think the main things I sort of use are emails and you know I, I try the emails blog Moodle voting polls you know all these on online tools um, and so this new, the newest thing that I've, I've sort of tried recently is this thing called these MOOCs right these massively online courses um, and how I got involved in that is basically about a year and a half ago, the company Udemy approached me. They had this thing called the Faculty Project. Um, let's see if I could bring up their site. Um, and so they, so they had this thing called the Faculty Project saying that, oh, well, they, they call it the best professors. I'm not gonna say, I, I think that's a little too much, right? But you know, the idea is they're gonna bring together the best professors from the world's leading universities are coming together to teach online for free. All right, and so they're basically recruiting, you know, rec recruiting people from, you know, from different schools to basically teach something, um, something they, they know a lot about. Um, I, I think, as I said earlier, Udemy is basically this online site. The main purpose of Udemy is to sort of help people that have something to teach, something to teach, and give them the tools to put them, put, to put them online e easier. Right, the name Udemy, I think it's sort of, I, I always hated it. I, I kept telling them, to, telling them to change the name. I think it's like some mix of YouTube and Academy, but, you know, I don't know. But, that, but, that, but that's what, what, what they're stuck with. And so, you know, I, I think, so I, let me just sort of give you a, a sense of what, what I did for Udemy. Um, so here are some of the other classes, classes that are being taught. You know, so there's basically a class on, you know, math is everywhere, a class on modern China. This is my class on energy economics and the environment. All right. So, so basically, so I think clicking here brings you to the course site. So this is, uh, to, uh, I guess I have to register. So, um, so what well, so brings you to the course site? The course site basically will tell you things, like it'll tell you, the, it'll, it'll show you the lectures. Each lecture I basically have a, a video, um, and then each video you can download the slides, and then I, I, from the time to time I sort of offer course notes. Um, if you actually log in, you can basically see reviews, and you can sort of see questions students ask and students can answer and answer for each other. Um, I think last time I checked there were 2,500 students uh, subscribed to this, I guess 2,537. Um, and so it's something that's, you know, which in some ways, I don't know if that's big or small, right? But I guess it's sort of more than more people than ambassadors, so that's kind of exciting. 
Um, but at the same time, you know, it's also hard to, hard to sort of tell, you know, how, how many people are taking it seriously. But I've got a lot of people like with comments all the way throughout. So I think a good number of them are actually taking the course um, all the way through. Um, let, let, let me try to play for you the, the sort of opening <coughs> video. <laughs> Experts say that energy and environmental issues will be two of the most important issues of the 21st century. Demand for electricity is doubling every 25 years. New power plants are being built at the pace of over one per week, wreaking havoc on our global supply chains and natural resource production. Left unchecked, global climate change is going to touch every aspect of daily life, potentially changing how we live forever and ever. Or is it? This course will take a sober look at the facts of energy and climate change from an economics perspective. My name is Ben Ho, and I come at this problem with multiple degrees. So don't talk about me too much. Now, that, that's sort of me selling, selling the course. Um, but, so, but so basically, that's just a brief, brief idea of what the course would look like. Um, I could have probably put in more production value. You know, if, if you want to sort of go to the site, you can sort of explore some of the other courses. Some are very simple. Some are just somebody sitting there in front of a camera talking. Some are sort of more elaborate with sort of camera panning and, and camera scrolling. I sort of took the more intermediate point of view, which is basically just, you know, I, I, use, this pro, I use this program called Explain Everything for the iPad. What it lets you do is it lets you sort of take, you know, any PowerPoint presentation and then basically to sort of, you know, record, record over it, edit it, edit it, sort of talk over it, you know, take notes on it, sort of draw on it. I didn't do that. Um, in these slides, but that, that, that's what I sort of do throughout, and that's sort of how these lectures go. Um, I, you know, the que and then I, and I think a question people often ask me is, why did I do this, right? So, you know, Udemy is a free project, so basically everyone, you know, who's signed up for the faculty project is doing it for free. Um, I think I actually studied this question a long time ago. My master's thesis was looking at open source software, trying to understand why do people contribute to open source software? Why do people contribute to the common good? Right? I think sort of the, the you know, sort of, that, sort of that, 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 that project sort of tested six sort of different theories of why people, why, why people contribute. Right? The typical the theories were basically money, your career concerns, reputation, learning, reciprocity, helping the cause, and fun. All right? And in that study, they found that actually most people contribute not for money, not for career gains, but actually for, for basically learning. Right? And I think this was, for me, that, that was a big part of it, to learn about how online education works. And also for basically, you know, helping the cause, right? That basically, I sort of, this is something I believe strongly in. You know, I, I think, you know, you, you listen to the public debate about energy and the environment, and you hear a lot of scientists talking, but you don't hear a lot of economists talking. And I think a lot, I think economics actually has a lot to say about, you know, energy and environmental issues. That's, um, that is, I sort of felt, I felt strongly about getting out there. Um, so I think in terms, of the, in terms of the learning component of it, I think, you know, I basically sort of learned, learned a lot about, you know, the, the sort of the difference between teaching online and sort of teaching in, 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 in at Vassar. I mean, I think what, I, I was very worried, right? When, when, when they approached me to this, I told them, I'm not sure if I could do this, right? The way I teach is very interactive, right? The way I teach depends very much on conversation, depends very much on sort of just dialogue. I, I like asking questions, I like, you know, feeding on people. And here, this is me talking to a screen, which feels sort of awkward. Um, and so it's, it's something you have to learn. I, I like the fact that you know, there's still you know, sort of email communication that goes on back and forth, but on the whole, it's not the same. Right? With 2,500 students, I can't really deal with that many responses, so a lot of it is just left, left to the students to answer, answer for themselves. Whereas, you know, at Vassar, I like, I like the fact that I can email all my students and sort of know them on a, on a personal basis. So that's, you know, that's, that's sort of one thing, one thing I had to get used to. The other thing that I had to get used to was that the lectures have to be shorter, right? People, it's hard to watch a video for, for you know, 75 minutes. Right, whereas for a class, you know, you, 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 with, with discussion and, and interaction and other activities, 75 minutes is not too bad, but, you know, it, hopefully. <laughs> but, you know, here, I try, I try to keep most of my videos around 15 to 20 minutes, because after that, it's really hard to sort of, you know, just watch a, watch a talking head on, on the screen. Um, I also realized that you, you to me, this online is a much more visual medium, right? So you basically had to learn, you had, you had to sort of, you know, put more effort into slides, put more effort into drawing, whereas in class, you know, it's more about discussion. Here, it's more about, you know, pictures and, and animations, which are, I think, really powerful learning mechanisms, but just very different than what I was used to. Um, it was also hard dealing with people with different backgrounds, right? So, so here, teaching a class, you sort of know that everyone has the same prereqs. You could sort of like, you know, to tailor it for tailor it for that. But here, if I tried to use some math models, you know, I, I knew some people would appreciate it, but most people would hate it, and so that was sort of a delicate balancing act. 
Um, and then finally, different motivations, right? I think in, in class, you know, people, students are sort of more, more homogeneous in terms of what they're looking for. Online, you know, some of them are like just curious citizens, wanting to learn about the environment. A lot of them are teachers, interested in learning how, how to teach this material better. A lot of, some of them are sort of students who want to supplement their own coursework. And it was sort of difficult, sort of like targeting the classes for each of these different audiences. Um, so that's sort of the lessons I learned. In terms of sort of how this applies to you and how this applies to Vassar, you know, I just had some thoughts. I think Tom, will, I'll, I'll, I'll be brief here because I'm out of time and I think Tom will say more about this later. But I think this might say something, this might help with like the flipped classroom idea, right? The idea that, you know, instead of, that in classes where there's lecture material, we could put that lecture material online, have them watch it at night, and then focus the class time on interaction and discussion. I sort of do that already, but I think if, 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 there's, if there's more material online, I could probably do that even more. Um, it could be a supplement for people interested in class, right? I always feel, I always, like people have taken my class and like try to stuff in too much in every class period. And you know, this is a way to sort of, you know, take some of that burden and move it online so I don't have to do it all at once. Um, it's a way to sort of hone teaching skills, you know, and hone class design. Basically designing a class for 2,000 people sort of makes you really have to focus on, on, on what, what makes a class work. It's a way to sort of broaden, you know, the master brand, right? And so that, and so far that matters. Or broaden your own brand, right? If you care about your own reputation, getting your name out there, I think, sort of matters. Um, it has a higher potential for like broader impacts. In so far as we sort of care about broader impacts, I think that's, um, I, I, I think, I think, I think that's really important. Um, and you're supposed to use it to learn something. I think that's, you know, for me, just it, yeah. For me, I think the main reason I did is to learn something new, and I thought I got a lot out of the project. Um, so maybe check it out. It's open to anybody. Anybody can go and open a course. Um, Udemy.com. That's it. Thanks, Ben. Um, next, we have Sarah Chang. Sarah Chang, I am a senior. I'm a biochemistry major, but I have always been interested in technology and specifically image um, visualization and graphic design. So I was asked to be on this panel um, because I am currently the VSA student representative for the Committee of Academic Technologies, um, but to also speak about my role in creating and building classroom kind of visual resources for um, Professor Andrew Talon from the um, Professor Talon is, a, is an expert on um, medieval art and architecture. And I, for the past few years, I have been working with him to kind of bring the experience of being at an architecture site into the classroom for his seminar students. And what he, um, one of the best parts of the job is to work with these amazing visual materials and one of the um, things that he does is to capture 360 degree spherical panoramic images. And here's a website I made for his class. It is of the Chartres Cathedral. Um, and using the laser floor plans, I got to map out um, different parts of the cathedral that he had special interest in. And so students can go in and kind of zoom in and really kind of see what um, the actual perspective is, is um, from different sites at the cathedral. So this is um, one of the projects that I've been working on. And this is what Steve was saying is part of the enhanced classroom experience. Um, instead of like the MOOC and the online learning, it is more to supplement and enhance um, what is being taught in classroom. And at the moment, I am working on um, kind of laser scan images. And this is of the Notre Dame Cathedral. Um, this is like the end product, but we were using laser scans um, that when constructed correctly on the computer, they would allow um, for accurate measurements down to the millimeter scale. And um, this is a way for students to really like fly in and really get to see what is going on in the cathedrals. And after the laser scans are done, these are, um, we can like put on image textures onto the lasers. Um, 
laser points. And this is also another tool to kind of help the um, class environment. So that's what I've been working on. And yeah. Thank you. Um, and Matt, is next? Cognitive Science and Neuroscience double major. Um, and I'm here primarily in my capacity as Vice President for Academics at the Bachelor Student Association. But um, as it turned out, as I was writing this, also as a Cognitive Science student. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about what I think are the everyday effects and what I've gotten from speaking to students and faculty as being sort of the um, common implications of the ubiquitousness of simple technologies and by simple, I mean things like cell phones and email and Moodle um, in the way we do education here at Vassar. Um, I have a PowerPoint, but I don't actually want to use it, um, <laughs> given what I'm going to say. So I think there's three big things to talk about, one of which is the way we interact with each other and um, parallel the way we interact with our educational materials, um, like books and text. Um, the other the second thing is how we go about paying attention and how technology is changing our attention span and closely related is the third thing, which is how we access information um, in terms of library resources or search engines and so on. Um, so interaction, the first thing is actually PowerPoints. Uh, what a lot of students tell me is that when you have a PowerPoint in a classroom, and that's how you're doing a lecture, what it does is put a physical structure in the space that enforces the transmission model of learning, um, where you have a professor who's up here broadcasting information and all the students have to do is sit there and receive it. Um, as opposed to the much richer model where you have interaction um, and sort of this ongoing problem solving between <coughs> the professor and the student, which is maybe easier to do in the absence of a PowerPoint. And what students tell me is that in classrooms where technology has been banned absolutely and completely, um, so notes are by hand and PowerPoints are non existent, um, you actually do get this richer dynamic of sort of give and take between student and professor. Um, the second thing is about blog posts and the use of. Little blogs, but also other kinds of uh, online responses. There's a potential beneficial effect here, which is that it makes the students agree with the reading because they have to think about it and produce some kind of feedback. But there's a potential detrimental effect if the blogs are used um, by a professor or a student discussion leader in a way where they go through and they pull out the talking points from the student responses and then they use those to structure the classroom time. They say, let's go through what people put in their responses. Because then instead of having a conversation based on what people are thinking and how people are reacting to the classroom space, all you're doing is recapitulating what people wrote in their responses and then sharing with the class, which is still useful, but again, you lack this, this is going to take this interaction. Um, so in general, the, the point here is that when you have interpersonal interactions in the classroom mediated through technologies, um, like blogs and email and um, communication of digital text, the skills a student end up, end up with may be, and I think this is another question, the skills a student end up, end up with may be um, use of technology skills rather than learning skills or uh, mental skills around information processing and understanding critical thinking. Um, and to me, that seems like a significant danger. Um, for example, our generation um, doesn't really plan ahead in terms of social get-togethers. We just text each other when lunchtime rolls around. Um, I gather that didn't used to be the case. <laughs> um, it's also worth thinking about how we use Moodle to communicate, for example, PDFs and other kinds of resources. Um, so I've been told by professors that they're concerned that when they do all the work and they put together this really rich set of materials and they give it to their students, the students then complete the course without any research skills because they never have to go find anything on their own. And so there's the benefit of having you know the best possible materials selected for them, but the detriment that they never learn how to go find good materials. Uh, independent. Um, on the other hand, I think technology can have an extremely beneficial effect in our classrooms here. One example that I really like is this concept of uh, instant, instant polling, where you have some kind of presentation, like a PowerPoint, and you pose a question that's maybe extremely sensitive, or that people don't want to um, discuss openly, and you say to the students, just text your response to this number. And the responses come in, and they get graphed um, and presented in diagram form in live time 
in the presentation. And then you have this way where you can have sort of a seamless conversation around a sensitive topic without having to like pause and have people write things down on paper and then um, sort of share them aloud in some way. Um, and then I also really like the flipped learning idea where you present the transmission part of your class online as homework. Well. Um, in the form of a video lecture, and then the classroom time can be used for problem solving and interaction, talking through problems. Um, and I think students in general have an extremely positive response to that kind of because um, we love our professors. And I think generally it's perceived as more valuable to talk to a professor than to be talked at by a professor. Um, which gets into the second issue, which is about attention. Um, I think there's a danger that when you start uh, enriching content, for example, a lot of math textbooks now have online resources where you present answer keys or you present like a how-to guide for a complex piece of software, um, which is necessary in some sense to use a complex piece of software. Um, but then you're spending some of your homework time switching back and forth between informational <coughs> resources rather than actually using informational resources. So you're going from textbook to computer to printed PDF um, rather than really focusing on coursework. Um, However, as a counterpoint, I think a 15 or 20 minute lecture, um, like a video lecture, is actually an extremely valuable attentional resource because good data suggests that in a classroom, students tend to pay attention in 10, 15, or 20 minute cycles. Um, and so over the course of a 50 or 75 minute lecture, you actually have people sort of phasing in and out in terms of how much attention they're paying, even if they are, um, in general, undevoted and sort of physiologically the attentional resources we have are limited. So that might be an extremely useful way to present information. Um, really good examples, um, aside from giving me our TED Talks, we can say animate talks. Um, and I've spoken to students here who have positive experiences using TED Talks um, as part of the homework assignments in the classes. Um, other things to think about in terms of attention are problems with technology malfunction, where if technology is an integral part of the classroom, and of course, as you sort of transition into more technologically oriented classroom spaces, um, with distance learning being extreme, a technological malfunction is literally a uh, disruption of the classroom space. The direct analog in a traditional classroom would be like a professor, you know, suddenly starts stuttering or has a stroke, or you know, it's pretty catastrophic <laughs> in terms of how you're presenting the material. Um, and so that's that's a danger that can occur. Um, and then. There's a related issue that people make that's been sort of receiving a lot of attention in the popular press. There have been good articles in the Atlantic and the New York Times, um, which is this issue about are we losing our deep reading skills, our deep writing skills, because we engage in information in different ways. So something that I complain about a lot and that I hear other students complain about a lot is that um, it's, it's much more difficult now than it used to be for some reason, for us personally, uh, to sit down and read a whole book or even to read a whole blog post if it's more than a couple of days. Um, it's much easier or it's, easier or it's more natural or it's more in line with the habits we've formed as students to read part of something and encounter a reference to something else and skip over and look at that and skip over to something else or just to read the abstract of the paper and move on. Um, and certainly I think that's extremely detrimental to learning. And you miss a lot of the nuance and you start to lose the skills in terms of paying attention to details um, across sources especially. Um, and that brings me to the last topic I want to talk about, which is changing research methods um, in terms of the speed with which we're able to do research. Um, so with resources like search engines and massive databases of digital journal content, um, you access information according to like a, a database sort of system. So rather than having like a book, which is a delineated and defined body of information, you then have to learn to navigate according to indexes and tables of contents and looking through pages. Um, you just have this massive miasma of digital information which is tagged and cross-referenced and sorted in various ways and is usually very flexible in that sense. You have ebooks, you have uh, journal articles that are instantly accessible, you have blog posts, and you have um, comments on blog posts and comments on journal articles and so on. But um, it's all sort of homogenous um, and it's all instantly accessible and it's all equally accessible. And so what that means is you don't develop a skill set for interacting with a physical object like a book or uh, a journal or even in the library, for example, a bookshelf full of journals. Um, librarians tell me they haven't seen students in the periodical stacks in like a decade. <laughs> um, 
But that didn't used to be the case. Again, which is a strange thing. Um, and so I think that the way we go about accessing information does potentially change our physical resources and the skills we come away with as students, and then also our cognitive resources. So it's sort of a fad to complain about how Google is stealing our short-term memory, um, but there's interesting evidence that that may actually be the case, where when you never exercise your short-term memory because your smartphone is used and access to all the information you want, um, you lose your short-term memory skills. Thank you. Media studies, so I guess that makes me the technology guy. But um, I, uh, I'm actually not going to talk about technology at all. Instead, I'll talk about things where I don't have any particular expertise, and um, which is kind of awkward for me because why should I be up here? And I'm going to talk about things where I have more expertise than anybody else in the room. Fortunately, um, I'm actually not going to say anything. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, instead, I'm just going to raise questions. I gave some thought ahead of time uh, to the possibility of whether I could really go through a whole 10 minutes only uttering questions with no indicative statements. <laughs> I tried it, I, I didn't get very far, so uh, some other time I'll do that. Uh, so I'm going to talk about some of the issues that others have raised, particularly sort of what, what does online learning mean uh, for Vassar in terms of its direction for the future, you know, in a kind of a large sense. And um, I, want to, I want to raise following question, which I think is sort of the, the, the biggest one of all that we need to, to use to frame this whole discussion, which is, what are the goals of liberal education? And I think um, it, it's, not, it's not clear what, to everybody what those goals are, or there's not, not necessarily agreement among everyone in the world about that. And I think the, you know, the question about where we go with online learning really has to be understood in, in relation to this question. OK, well, first of all, um, just uh, some things that I've looked at recently. Uh, um, at this, at actually, Kathy's suggestion, I read a couple of articles by, um, about online learning based on the CMU Open Learning Initiative. Um, in particular, looking at um, some studies that were done using um, a, a statistics course um, that was based on something called StatTutor, which you see in the right, the right picture over there. And uh, a study that that has been cited by some as suggesting that through online learning with this kind of interactive learning, uh, online learning environment, it's possible for students to learn the same amount of material twice as fast um, with the same quality as in a traditional course. And in fact, that, there was a study sort of that, that done by um, CMU doing that. And here's, a, here's a, a quote from the paper. In the study, results show that OLI statistics students learn a full semester's worth of material in half as much time and performed as well or better than students learning from traditional instruction over a full semester. So that there's a cost, a huge potentially a cost savings. Actually, one there are a number of you know there are a number of questions I have about this study, um, re, you know, regarding methodology and actually didn't measure faculty time and they only measured student time, so it's not clear where was actually cut, cut in half with student time. It was quadruple, probably. So, and, and ACS time was probably went to infinity, right? So, okay. Um, uh, but but re, there's sort of a larger question here. It, the, the, sort of the, the methodology in this was to, to sort of run two sets of students, sort of randomly selected, assigned to courses, to, to, do, to the online course and the, and the uh, traditional course, and then test them all at the end and compare them, see how they did. Um, but this sort of assumes that the goal of uh, this course was to learn statistics, okay, which you might think is obvious, but I actually want to suggest maybe that's not obvious. It might not be the actual goal of a statistics course. Okay, I'll come back to that later. Uh, just another, another quote from a related article um, on the same, I think the same people, 
working on online at public university at the instance from randomized trials. This study, uh, the quote here talks about the, the, the goals of the, of the, the, the anticipated cost savings. A large share of the cost savings, large share of the cost savings derived from shifting away from time spent by expensive professors toward both machine guided instruction that stays on staffing cost overall and toward time spent on less expensive staff in the Q and A set. But you won't have the graduate students if you get rid of the professors. Well, right. <laughs> okay. Good point. Anyway, the, so, so the, you know, the model here, I think, is, you know, fewer full professors, lots of professor licks, whatever they are. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, um, actually, here's, a, here's the website of the company tutor that, um, that Steve mentioned earlier. Um, and Steve said they're forming a consortium of universities and liberal arts colleges to distribute and sell courses <laughs> online. And so, you know, we might ask ourselves, should Vassar participate in something like this? And I want to kind of address that in what I'm going to say next. Um, but before I get to that, um, I'm not actually going to answer that question. I'm going to really raise, raise question, more questions about it. But I'd like to, for those of you who are, who are college graduates, I'd like to think for a minute, how much do you actually remember of your college education? What you actually learned. I mean, you know, I, I won't tell you how long ago I graduated. It was several decades ago I graduated from college. I can't remember anything from any of my courses. Okay, very, very little in terms of the details of what I've learned. Okay, in a few cases, if I happen to work in the same subject continuously, I remember a little bit. But I do remember my professors very well. Or at least a, a few professors I remember extremely well. I'll think of them, you know, several times a month for the, for for most of them, and some of them. More you know, so they had a big impact on me, and I, I would imagine that's true for many of you folks as well. So I'm going to argue that, in fact, what what's really going on in liberal education is, is a social process that involves relationships between students and students and students and professors, and and the the, ch the, the the changes in personality, the personal growth that students go through by participating in that in those relationships. And that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do. Um, so, uh, I'll, I'll say more about that later, but here, the, if you believe that, if you believe that education is a social process, then I think there's some questions we really need to ask about, about um, how online learning is going to impact that social process. So here's, here's some questions I would like us to be asking. So does online learning, whatever version you want to talk about, does that promote or support a learning community, like what we have here at Vassar? You know, for example, does it foster relationships among peers, peer groups of students who work together to learn things, or relationships between peers or between students and their mentors? A big part of what happens when a student learns a subject is, is not just absorbing material, but actually to take on an identity as a certain kind of thinker. You know, when I was in college, I thought of myself as a physicist. I was going to be a physicist. I wanted to think of myself as a physicist. I ended up doing that, but, but that, I was trying on that identity. And I, you know, in trying on that identity, I was identifying with my professors, also with my fellow students who were sort of trying on the same identity at the same time. Of course, to do that, I had to have other students around to identify with. Does, uh, does online lear learning inspire independent work? Does it motivate the student to go on and go beyond the course? So that's one set of questions. Another set of questions are sort of strategic, economic type questions that I think the college should ask. So for example, suppose we start, suppose we were to team up with, with Coursera or Tudor or some other com com company, distribute our stuff online. You know, it raises a question of what will happen to what we do here at Vassar. Will we, if we have, if we start maybe making money or getting other kind of brownie points by putting courses online, will that affect the courses that we create here? Well, it seems like it could. After all, I don't want to have to develop my course twice. I'd like to develop the same course and use it here and online. And now the question is, will my course here change because I'm putting it online? In a good way? No. Okay. Well, behind me. Same thing. If we become, if, if online learning becomes a big part of what we do, will we end up hiring faculty because they're experts at online learning as opposed to the give and take of classroom relationships? Um, of course, the big question is, why will parents dish out the 60,000, 70, 80, whatever it is in the next decade, a year to send their students to college if somebody says, hey, you can get that online for free? Well, actually, the, really, the, the parents really know might say, we know it's not really about the course. 
which is, it's about the connections you make. So, but that's another story. <laughs> and finally, if, if we put courses online and they don't meet Vassar standards, then um, it could be very bad for us and we could give Vassar a bad reputation. Okay, so those are all things I, I, want, I, I think we should think about. Oh, and sort of in a larger sense, one more thing is, can online, could the online learning phenomenon ultimately diminish public support for liberal education? I mean, if it's all free, then will Congress continue to support student loan programs, for example? I can, you can imagine the arguments in Congress. Why are we paying for all this stuff when it could be given away? It is being given away. So here, so here I want to suggest a different way for us as advisors to think about how to use uh, information technology, online learning in particular. So one, one question we should be asking is, how can we use the stuff here to strengthen our residential learning experience, quite apart from whether we you know, ship our stuff overseas to other people? And in particular, can we use social media, online lectures, interactive environments to strengthen the relationships among students, with, and students in their peer groups and students and faculty, and sort of build those you know, build those, uh, motivate, help develop the kind of motivation that comes out of mentoring relationships and peer relationships. So, that, so that's one thing. But maybe even more important is, uh, is the second thing I have to say, which is how can we use uh, network-based information technology to educate the public about the nature and value of liberal education? And this is actually something that's pretty important. And I'll give you a couple of examples. So here is um, Rick Scott, governor of Florida, Here's a quote, something you said a few months ago. We don't need a lot more anthropologists in the state. It's a great degree if people want to get it, but we don't need them here. I want, to, I want to spend our dollars giving people science, technology, engineering, and math degrees. That's what our kids need to focus all their time and attention on. These types of degrees, so when they get out of school, they can get a job. OK, no anthropologists in Florida. <laughs> you know, sorry. Somebody might have pointed out to him that there are there are a few companies in Florida who are in the people business, like say Disney, you know, who maybe could hire a few anthropologists if they don't already. And of course there are a lot of people in Florida who might sort of be people, you know, be somehow have an interest in anthropology. But the real point is it's all about a job. I mean, learn this, get a job. Learn fact X, use fact X, get a job. But it's not just it's not just public figures like governors of Governor of Florida. Here's another person, Andrew Hackett, professor at CUNY, wrote an article in the New York Times. His hours were necessary. His answer was no. Um, that he was destroying young minds um, by forcing them to learn something that was really hard. Um, and and uh, he he said it's not clear that the math we learn in the classroom has any relation to the quantitative reasoning we need on the job. Okay, again. Got to learn the algebra so that you can use it on the job. Okay, so, so you know, I, uh, what I would argue is that that's not why we teach algebra. Okay, I mean there, there there are a lot of reasons why we teach algebra, but really very little of it is that you're going to use that quadratic formula on the job. Okay, hey, I actually use a quadratic formula. <laughs> <laughs> Almost nobody else ever does that. <laughs> all right, so so there's something else going on. Um, all right, so what is what are the goals of liberal education? This is a quote from Derek Bach's book, Our Underachieving Colleges. With all the controversy over the college curriculum, it is impressive to find faculty agreeing only that students to think critically is the principal aim of undergraduate education. Okay, so there you are. Critical thinking. Actually, he goes on to say there's not a lot of agreement as to what critical thinking <laughs> is, but that we should be we shouldn't be encouraging it is is a, there's a lot of agreement about that. Yeah, but, that, but that discussion is because most people have been had that education, so they, you know, they know that there's nuances of everything. They've had a great. <laughs> we have to argue about something. Well, actually, it turns out this view is not universal. For example, in the Texas Republican Party platform for 2012, we oppose the teaching of higher order thinking skills, POTS. <laughs> values clarification, critical thinking skills, and similar programs that are simply a relabeling of outcome-based education, OBE, mastery learning, which focus on behavior modification and have the purpose of challenging the student's fixed beliefs <laughs> and undermining parental authority. Okay, so it's actually in the Republican Party platform for 
for 2012 in mm -hmm. Texas. I think some of them have disavowed it and said, but we can't get it out now. So, so it's there. Um, you know, uh, so not everybody supports the idea of critical thinking, which is odd. I want to argue that's very strange for, for a country like the United States in that we as Vassar, places like Vassar should make it our mission to try to address, and address this and explain why, in fact, critical thinking is not just about their jobs, although it helps their job, um, but it's actually about something that all Americans claim to care about. Okay. What's what is the, the single word that you know is supposed to come to mind when you think of American? Freedom. Right. Freedom. Right. It's freedom. It's all about freedom. So the example I have in mind is, is a um, you know you're a so imagine a, a young man raised in a very traditional conservative family in Texas who's taught that homosexuality is a sin. Okay. Since since he was too little to remember, and then he gets to be 13, 14 and starts to have feelings for other young men. And he's got a problem, right? What's he going to do? And if he's never, never had the opportunity to, to see how people in other cultures, in other places, in other times have thought about this question, that young man can't possibly be free to, to decide how he wants to deal with this situation. Okay. So this is what. So this is an argument that critical thinking is absolutely necessary for free for human freedom. Well, of course, the interesting thing is, I bet people in Texas, many, I'm, I'm sure I'm insulting somebody from Texas here, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sure there are many people in Texas who would say, hey, Texans value freedom more than anybody else. Okay, so maybe this is an argument we can make for people in Texas. Anyway, here are my own, um, couple of my favorite quotes about um, liberal education that I hope we can keep in mind is if we can, if we can actually undertake a campaign using media technology to promote liberal education, to in a country where it's really under attack at the moment. Paulo uh, Freire, the um, Brazilian educator, has a book called Education as the Practice of Freedom. Um, very much the kind of thing I had in mind when I lived in Texas, the young man from Texas. And then there's William Butler Yates. Education is not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. The point is we have to inspire the students and then they do all. Thank you. Uh, let's start off by having a hand for our panelists. Uh, we are scheduled uh, to, to, um, to continue for another 30 minutes. I hope that as many of you as possible can stay for that. Um, what we'd like to do uh, in that time is open up the floor for uh, the rest of the folks here. If you have a question for an individual on the panel, the panel as a whole, or just want to make uh, comments to the entire group, um, that's what we'll be doing. Um, if you are a soft-spoken person, I encourage you to come up and get a microphone. If you want to stay where you're sitting, I encourage you to speak loudly so we can hear uh, across the room. Can I answer a question first? Uh, so actually one of Tom's questions I thought was very interesting about what, what you learned in school. And I think I mentioned earlier about the testing between the human capital and signaling model of education. And so another recent test, which is something I'm working on right now, is uh, a study by Heckman that basically sees that there's two ways you can get a high school education. One is four years of high school, taking classes and learning. And one is a three month GED preparation course that gets you the same high school degree and actually exactly the same test scores as basically four years of high school education. And so in some ways, it really was like learning to take, to take the test is what mattered, then you would think the GED would be much more efficient, right? Learning in six months instead of learning in four years. But what had been found is actually that the GED was useless almost, right? That you know, having a GED not only was not a signal of a high school degree, but also it didn't seem to, it didn't seem to help them get better jobs in the future. And so Heckman concludes that something else about what you learn in high school. He's, he's arguing social and conscientiousness and other things, but I think there's probably some, some similar dynamic going on, you know, for college as well. Uh, I just want to say something quickly because I'm late for class. Um, <laughs> so, um, uh, one of the things I think that maybe is being missed is um, not in the, in the exploration of what is valuable about classroom teaching or online teaching, but 
one of the things that concerns me is, um, on the one hand, um, and is your name Hall? Yes. Yeah. When you said we don't do it better, you were equating at that moment better with cheaper. Okay. So are we moving towards an idea of the bottom line? And, and I think we are a bit at Vassar in very many ways. Not the bottom line being cost. And what do you trade for cost? And then the other thing is there's also a little bit of a, well, there's a bandwagon thing, but there's also this either or thing. So I don't see why one, one can't embrace the idea of um, Kmart existing in the world. Uh, I, I couldn't think of a better <laughs> other extreme. And the Metropolitan Museum of Art, let's say even though I may have philosophical problems with both. But <laughs> that aside, why does the Metropolitan Museum of Art have to become Kmart for some idea of um, bottom line economics and making sure everybody gets reached by the same method and with the same information? So I'm just throwing that out before I go to class and, and my students leave before I get there. Drop your bomb and run. Okay, <laughs> bye everybody. <laughs> uh, actually, I'm going to say similar to what Harry said. And, uh, so I want to share my understanding of the talk and make a, a, a comment at least. I, I think the talk was about online universities. So this wasn't. Phoenix University, which is online, this was online courses. So it's totally possible to have the college experience, but you substitute a portion of the courses with online courses. You gain efficiency and the most that's efficiency in terms of cost cutting, one, but also efficiency. Some student, for example, wants to catch up with the second major. They decided later to go there. They can take some of the core courses here, and they still have to take a set of courses from the main part. So I just want to second Harry that it's, uh, it's not an either or situation in my view. Yeah, I think uh, I've tried to frame this discussion as broadly as possible uh, so that that is one of the flavors of online education, which is having a, uh, an online course as part of a uh, residential uh, uh, college experience. But uh, I think one of the, one of the things to keep in mind um, with thinking about this topic in regard to Vassar College is what goals do we have in mind when we might consider something like this? Would we, would we be thinking about, is online learning got a way that will help Vassar students by enhancing, like you said, you know, allowing them to take a course that's part of the schedule? Or are we looking at a goal of can Vassar help to educate the great masses of people who can't attend a college? You know, uh, some of these things uh, uh, respond to one goal, not another. I sort of have a question for, for Ben again, and I just wondered if you had your Vassar students take your online course or tested it with any of your students. No, I've mentioned it. I don't, I don't teach energy here at Vassar. So, so at Vassar, I teach you know, behavioral economics and political economy. Um, but I, I have had students in my microeconomics class come to me and say, hey, that, that, you know, that lecture you spent on energy was really fascinating. What can I learn more? And I said, well, so, and, and, and then I referred to them. But I haven't followed up on them to see how they liked it. But I think that's something I, I, I definitely should do. Because I think to follow up on that, I think one of the advantages of having online courses possibly not as a regular part of the curriculum but as available and as some students can count towards their Vassar degree if it's been properly vetted is the idea of particularly in a small department that happens to teach a large subject but can only have a few professors in that subject and you have a student who's interested in a particular area of the major or of the, of the particular subject that is not taught at Vassar for them to be able to take this course that supplements their, their Vassar education and, and get credit for it. No, that's actually, that makes a lot of sense. And I actually, I actually have a student who came to me wanting to do an independent study on energy economics. And, you know, and it sort of, it sort of didn't happen. He got busy with 
piece, but actually thinking about it, this course would be a perfect way to do that, right? If you could basically go watch this course and meet with me once a week and talk about it, I think that would be an excellent way to do an independent study to sort of fill in a gap in a class that we can't teach here. So I think that makes a lot of sense. A variation on that, uh, an idea that's a variation on that that is going around is uh, the idea of a consortium of like colleges, similar colleges, who might jointly be able to offer courses in obscure subjects that no one of those colleges could really pull off. Um, you know, teaching a course in Swahili, you know, maybe maybe none of the school of a dozen schools could could warrant uh, hiring an instructor, and filling a class in that. But if they could enroll students from those dozen schools, they might be able to offer it via distance. So that's that's one of the flavors of this. Yes. In fact, I'm I'm doing that. Um, the Center for Hellenic Studies in Washington D.C. has run it's actually. It's like, <laughs> it's not in Swahili, but it is in an obscure subject, medieval Latin, and they offer a curriculum each semester. Um, there's about eight institutions that offer a home version of the course, and then there's about 12 faculty who are involved in the planning of the course. And so the home home sessions meet once uh, three times a week, just like a normal class, and then once a week we have a video conference um, lecture by one one of the faculty, and I, I think it doesn't save the home faculty anything in terms of class time or the home institution anything in terms of FTEs, but it does save the burden of designing the course, especially in an area that a lot of traditionally trained, cl trained classes just don't have that much knowledge, and it saves us the sort of having to give the overarching intellectual narrative each week, because that's distributed among the uh, students. I brought, I mentioned it just because it's an example of what Steve was describing, but also because I, it's been interesting participating in that and seeing the way, some ways that maybe the technology can uh, increase what we're doing in the in the home classroom. Because what we do when we offer these lectures is, I'm say I'm giving a lecture, I'm sitting there with a screen in front of me and I'm talking to the camera, and I can we use Google Hangouts and I can see at the bottom a video image of what's going on in each of the eight classrooms that are participating. And then there's a chat room going at the same time uh, in a different window. And what's quite interesting while I'm giving giving a lecture is I can see in those videos that sometimes my colleagues are talking to their class while I am. <laughs> and I don't know if they turn off the sound on me or not. <laughs> they are definitely, they are definitely they are definitely having their own interaction. And then at the same time in the chat room, I can see that there's a whole conversation going on in the chat room while my my lecture is is taking place, and I try to I try to sort of make it as interactive as I can. So I sometimes will pose questions that they'll discuss in their home group and answer in the chat room. But even when I'm giving the kind of monologic discussion, there's a, there's a wide conversation going on in the chat room on all kinds of subjects that take their starting point from things I say, but go off in whatever uh, whatever directions the participants are interested in. And my colleagues are weighing in. In fact, I kind of sometimes wish my colleagues would joke around a little less in the classroom. But, there, but more importantly, the students are talking to each other and talking to professors from other institutions and things. And so it's, kind of, it's a kind of interesting example of how if the, you know, I don't like the idea of being muted by Brad at Ole Miss. But like, but if the, if the, if the, there's, if the professor is willing to give up a little control over what's going on, there's actually are ways for people to really target their experience of the class in real time to their own interests. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, and I think uh, I've heard you mention, Ben, that students take, looking at video lectures probably don't mute the instructor so much, but sometimes they do it one and a half speed or double speed, right? It's kind of, kind of a take control over that aspect of it. Uh, another thing that you mentioned about doing the different uh, different types of activities throughout a, a class session um, reminds me that we should keep in mind that some of these um, technologies um, aren't necessarily all or nothing for a class. So when we talk about flipped classrooms, you might say, well, you know, the idea of flipping a lecture outside of the classroom doesn't apply to me because in my class we have lots of discussion. But, maybe you have 15 minutes of lecture, you know, before your discussion, and that might be something that you could move on. So some of the activities that we could consider doing differently aren't necessarily 